Uh, good. So great to be back to the One World Signal Processing Seminars. Uh, today we are featuring a talk by Gita Kutiniuk from Ludwig Maximilian University, LMU Munich. Before we start the talk, let me remind you again to mute your microphones. If there are questions, please write them into the chat and we will have them addressed at the end of the talk. I would like to briefly introduce our speaker of today, Professor Gita Kutiniuk. She received her diploma and doctor degrees in mathematics and computer sciences from Paderborn University. She completed her habilitation at the University of Gießen and became a full professor at Osnabrück University. In 2011, she became the Einstein Chair at the Technical University of Berlin. And since uh, October 2020, she holds a Bavarian AI Chair at the Ludwig Maximilian University, Munich. Her research in interests include applied harmonics analysis, approximation theory, data science, statistical learning theory, compressed sensing, high dimensional data analysis and image sciences. Gita Kutiniuk received uh, numerous awards uh, um, and recognitions. It's impossible to mention them all here, uh, just a few. She became member of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities in 2016, and she was awarded SIAM Fellow in 2019. Today, she will speak about radio units and next generation radio maps using deep learning. So welcome, uh, Gita. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so very much. Uh, thank you very much for the very nice introduction. And also thank you very much for the invitation. It's certainly a great pleasure for me to give a talk in this uh, one word seminar series on signal processing. Uh, I think we all know how tremendously successful deep learning and uh, deep neural networks are. Um, and so in this talk, I would like to focus on this new methodology and show you what you can do with that concerning uh, computing radio maps and then also solving the localization problem. And I will also start with an introduction into neural networks um, and also talk uh, in the end a bit about how you can actually interpret those results because I think that's always one one quick question uh, one might ask. Now, yeah, I think, I mean, as, as everybody knows, I mean, deep learning is already all around us. I mean, think of self-driving cars, speech recognition tasks. In countries like the United States, also legal issues are already um, affected uh, to some extent by these methods. And then, I mean, certainly the whole healthcare sector, which unfortunately these days became even more important than it already is. Um, on the other hand, I mean, uh, there are also some, some voices um, which, which are a bit hesitant to some extent. So there was an incident just uh, basically two years ago at one of the big AI conferences where one of the uh, researchers won a prize there and then gave a plenary talk, Ali Achimi. Um, he stated that um, these type of methods are at this point uh, at the level still of alchemy. There's a lot of trial and error around. So it's uh, missing to some extent a theoretical foundation. On the other hand, I mean, if you look at the results which were achieved, I mean, these are truly spectacular. So also just, um, yeah, now basically one year ago, I mean, there was this article about um, solving protein structures and uh, the new algorithm based on deep learning as uh, the title says, makes gigantic leap in solving protein structures. And if you look at this uh, graph, I mean, you also see that it's kind of a quantum leap, which you can, which were now possible through these new algorithms here called alpha fold and alpha fold two. So in this talk, um, I will then focus on a particular application and show you what you can actually do there. And as I already indicated in the beginning, this will be uh, concerning radio maps. So computing in particular and predicting the path loss function. So the setting is, I mean, as you know, we have uh, transmitter receiver links in an urban domain. So we have here, as you see, a fixed transmitter location. And what you aim to compute is the path loss at all locations. Um, so at each point here in the city map in the urban environment, computing what the signal strength there is. I mean, there are various examples where you might wonder about um, a problem of this type, for instance, device-to-device -device link scheduling or also concerning 
uh, cellular base station assignment. And so the main task there, which you need to solve, I mean, certainly if you have enough time and, and don't care about anything, I mean, it's, it's possible with formulas to compute this each time, but I mean, the task is certainly to do that in a highly efficient way and also in a very accurate way. So to get highly efficient and very accurate estimation of the pass loss function. So this will be uh, the main goal of this talk. But as I said, I would like to first, since I'm not sure if everybody is familiar and is very deep into deep neural networks, I would like to give you a short introduction into what those are and where they actually come from so that I hope you, you build up a bit of intuition on what they are, how you can actually use that. And also, I mean, I will have one slide just pointing out which, um, which theoretical directions are actually these days uh, important and where people are right now intensely working on to also build a more substantial foundation for those. So everything started in 1943 with uh, McCulloch and Pitts. I mean, what they aimed to do is they wanted to have an algorithmic approach to learning. So their goal was artificial intelligence. And what they did was certainly, I mean, extremely smart. The human brain is very good in learning. So their idea was to mimic the functionality of a human brain. Now, if one thinks back to your high school biology class, I mean, how was the human brain constructed? You have different neurons, which are then connected to form a neural network. And so, I mean, to mimic the functionality of the human brain, what they did was exactly that. They mimic the functionality of artificial neurons. So they introduced artificial neurons, which they then connected to a neural network. How can you do that? Well, I mean, what is, an, what is a neuron? Um, again, thinking back to your biology high school class. Um, so you have signals coming in here in these dendrites. These signals can be amplified depending on the structure of the dendrite. Then everything is collected in the soma, and then a decision needs to be reached whether this neuron fires or not. So whether it sends a signal in this axon to the next neurons which are attached here and to which, I mean, uh, so how strong this signal is. Ah, and so you can mimic this in the following way. You have signals here, x1, x2, x3, and so on. So these are just real numbers. You have weights which mimic the amplification by the dendrites. And then what arrives here is x1 times w1 plus x2 times w2 plus x3 times w3. Ah, and so now, I mean, you have the sum here. You need to decide whether to fire or not. That's done by a bias. So every neuron is assigned a bias. And now it's checked whether the sum is greater than the bias or not. And depending on that, the neuron um, sends out a 1 or a 0. Ah, so that's a very, very crude approximation of what a real neuron does. Now, you can, um, we will now connect these uh, artificial neurons into a neural network, and then you can wonder what, um, yeah, so what, what, what is the flexibility? Because later on, you need to adapt it to real data. And so the flexibility in each neuron, which is not fixed per se, are the weights and the biases. So these are the ones, the, the parameters, which we will learn later on and adapt to the data at hand. So you can write down exactly what such an artificial neuron is. Um, uh, so, I mean, in general, we have I don't know, N weights, we have a bias, we have an activation function, which gives us a bit more flexibility than this one zero situation from the previous picture. And then an artificial neuron is just this function. Uh, so you have here the sum, which we saw already before. You have the bias here, and now you apply here an activation function, which is typically nonlinear, since everything in here is linear, so you want to bring it also nonlinearly. Ah, and so on the previous slide, we had the heavy side function. Rho was just one or zero, depending whether this is greater or zero or not. But you can also use the sigmoid function. And what, what is nowadays the state of the art in some sense is what's called a rectifiable linear unit, or ReLU, which is just the max of zero and x. Ah, so it's a piecewise linear function. Very easy, but for most purposes, this is more than sufficient. So these are artificial neurons. I mean, now you can connect them. And so let me just show you at this example how, how you could do that. Please just take a look here. All these yellow circles are artificial neurons. 
they get their data from here. So these are the dendrites, for instance, in this case, they have, they have a bias here and the weights, you see the weights on the dendrites and then it's sent to the next layer of neurons. Uh, and also here, you have the dendrite coming in and the exon and so on. Uh, so this, this makes a lot of sense. You can write this also in a mathematical formula. And this you see here. Uh, so you have here the input x1, x2, x3. Then these connections, which we now drew here by hand, are encoded in such a matrix. You see the first output is this weight times x1 plus this weight times x2. So this mimics these two connections. The second part of the output is this weight times x3, which is this, and this mimics this connection. Then you have the bias here, which is this vector. Then in here, you apply the activation function. Uh, so this shows you how strong uh, you send out the signal on the axon. And then you have the next weight matrix, which is this. And again, a bias vector and so on and so on. Now, so I mean, um, so this is how you connect now artificial neurons in layers. And this is then the, the overall uh, definition. Most of you might have already seen that. So we have here x1, x2, x3, x4. And then you see here the layers of artificial neurons. Here you have the weights on all of those connections. And you, here in each neuron, you also have the bias. Also, I mean, the characteristics of such a neural network is the number of layers. The, um, also the number of layers, which is here, the activation function. And then you have these affine linear maps. So if you go back, you see this is exactly what is, is each time an affine linear map and also here. And then a neural network is a function from some RD to some R and L and L typically being equal to one, which looks like this. Uh, so we have here these affine linear maps and the activation functions which are applied component wise. Uh, and so, I mean, why are these so uh, effective these days? Well, I mean, there are basically two things which, which play a role, um, which were not there in 1943 which is um, now you can train deep neural networks with hundreds of layers. That seems to make a huge difference. And also you have huge amounts of data because we live in the age of data for training purposes. Yeah, and all of both of those things were not there in 1943, but now we have them. Um, there are also other types of or more sophisticated types of neural networks, for instance, convolutional neural networks. Um, this is what we will use um, later on. So you see here, this is, for instance, used for, for imaging because there, I mean, it's not that important where locations are. So the filters you use, I mean, these f linear maps are basically convolutions um, in a convolutional neural network. As you see here, you have, again, the input. So this is the, the, the layer of the weights. You have the activation functions as we had before. But then you have an additional layer here, which is the pooling layer uh, to each time compress again and then again do a convolution and so on. Also, and there are various types of different neural networks and there is a whole zoo out of those. How do you use them? Just also one quick, let's say, uh, run through the, the basic training um, of a neural network. So one can ask, I mean, what, what can you achieve with that? I mean, the main task of a neural network is to approximate functions given some data, training data. Um, so let's say you, you want to learn a function which is defined maybe on some even lower dimensional structure, like a manifold, but I mean, if you're not familiar with this, just think of RD. And maybe it's a classification function. Um, so let's say you have K classes. Uh, so depending on the input, you want to classify. And what you have at hand are sample values, so xi's and f of xi's, function values. Just as an example, um, people like to separate cats from dogs, so it's a very simple classification task. And let's assume you have a lower dimensional structure on which all images of cats and dogs lie. Let's say here you have the cats and here you have the dogs. And your function maps these images to the value one, and these images to the value two. 
Ah, and so now your samples are images together with f of xi, which is either one or two, which is then also the label of the picture. Okay, so you have your samples, your labeled pictures here in this example, and now you split it into two parts, one a training data set and the other a test data set. The test data set you don't touch. You only use it later on for testing how good your network has learned. But now, I mean, you set it just aside. Then, I mean, you need to decide a lot of things and that's what was alluded to before as trial and error. Uh, because now you have to decide which architecture to choose. Uh, so how many layers to take, how many neurons in each layer, which activation function, Maybe you also don't want to have a fully connected neural network, so you're meaning all possible connections because that has certain disadvantages during training. So you might want to pre-select only certain connections that corresponds to selecting entries of these weight matrices to set to zero at this point. Okay, so a lot of things to decide. No rigorous, let's say, theoretical foundation how you do that precisely and what the optimal way is. Then once you have decided that or tried out what the best architecture is, you need to train the network. And training, as I already said before, is learning the weights and the bias. Now, so that's actually a lot of parameters to learn. Um, you'd learn by an optimization problem. Uh, so please take a look here. So this is my network function. What you want is that the network function evaluated in your XIs, in your samples, is close to f of x i. Now that makes a lot of sense. And the closeness is given by a loss function. So for instance, you can take the square loss. So the difference squared. Then you might want to have also additional properties of your weight matrices and biases. Maybe you want to have them be sparse. You, what you would do for that is you would place the little one norm around that, which promotes sparsity. So add this as a regularization. Okay, so then you need to compute the minimum. This we do by gradient descent, but gradient descent per se doesn't work. Why? Well, I mean, M is usually in the millions and you certainly don't want to compute a million gradients each time. So what you do is you do, you do take randomly certain of those um, training data and only compute the gradients for that and then assume it's kind of a good average. So that's what's called stochastic gradient descent. Once you've solved this optimization problem and you have learned your f linear functions, you have your network. Now everything is fixed. Now you can test its performance. And what you want is certainly that this is close to your f. And testing the performance, you now pull out your test data set. So here you plug in your xi's and hope that this is then close to f of xi. From the, test, from the test data set, which the network has never seen before. Yeah, so that's in a way the ability of the network to generalize what you ask here, to generalize to other types of data it has not been exposed to before. Okay, so let me just, as I said, spend one slide now, I mean, uh, looking through this uh, training procedure or this general procedure, how to use neural networks, on what uh, the key theoretical questions are. I mean, this will be not the point of this talk, but since actually, yeah, I come from mathematics, this is also very close to my heart. So allow me this one, one page. So what, what, what is the first question? I mean, the first question is what's called expressivity, which network architecture to choose? Yeah, I said it's a lot of trial and error. And how does it affect the performance? So that's basically an approximation question. Yeah? So which, Network architectures have the best approximation or expressivity properties. The learning, yeah? so why does it converge that good? It's actually a non-convex problem and it's, you, you optimize over a very difficult landscape. It's not clear at all why stochastic gradient descent converts to good local minima. That's a big open question. Then generalization, um, as I said, now with the trend, with the test data set, we hope that the network performs well on other types of data. And also it's not clear why it doesn't overfit like you would normally expect with such a huge data, such a huge set of parameters. Yeah, so there are a lot of mysteries involved. These three 
um, questions which are posed here um, are also special because if you view a neural network as a statistical learning problem, these are exactly the three types of error you need to compute and estimate. There's the approximation error from the hypothesis class, which are here neural networks. There's the, algor the, the algorithmic error from the algorithm itself and this out of sample error, which comes from the fact that you just have samples at hand. Yes. So these are the three parts of the statistical learning model. There's another direction which I find also really exciting these days, which is explainability. That's a bit different. You, you have a trained neural network now, and you want to understand how it reaches decisions. Yeah, so you have a trained neural network, which maybe your colleague gave you, but it, he didn't tell you anything about it. It's just there. And you, 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 act, you, you let it run. It gets a decision and you would like to maybe check whether it does something reasonable. And this area I would like to, in the end, highlight a bit in more depth, because I think that's something which is, which is really important these days, um, also for the application, which, which I showed you, which I will show you, um, because that way you can also, to some extent, test trustworthiness of the approach. Okay. So now let's let's delve into the uh, the application I already announced uh, in the beginning. And let me start by introducing my collaborators, um, Giuseppe Caire uh, from TU Berlin, um, Ron Levy from LMU Munich from my group, a very, I mean, actually a brilliant postdoc um, who did most of the work on this, and then Kakan Gyapa from uh, TU Berlin, who is a PhD student of Giuseppe. Okay, so this slide you already saw before. That's basically the, the general setup. Um, as I said, you have a fixed transmitter location and you have this uh, urban environment and the task is now to compute the path loss at all locations. Later on, we will then also look at localizations. And the task is certainly highly efficient and very accurate estimation. So what are, let's say, also other applications which rely on that? Why are we interested in this? I mean, these I already briefly mentioned, and then there are a lot of other examples like fingerprint-based localization, physical layer security, power control in emerging systems, activity detection, and so on. Uh, I think, I mean, you from, let's say, electrical engineering, you, you might know much more about these specific examples than, than I do. But I think we all agree, hopefully, that radio maps are important to compute. So certainly, I mean, what you can do is you can drive a physical simulation. Uh, so there are formulas, what the path slot is at each location. You can compute those. Um, you can also use ray tracing. But all of those are quite slow. So our idea and what I would like to show you today is how you can use neural networks for solving this task. And as I said, I mean, there is a whole zoo of neural networks. So what we will use here is what's called a unit. So why is it called a unit? I mean, in this picture, you actually doesn't see it that beautifully, but um, so let, let me walk you through it. So a unit, um, we will later on, let's say, input here the urban environment and then what the unit does. You see, I mean, the layers compress the data to some extent and then expand it again up to the original size and that's then my output. But what you have here are so-called skip connections. The skip connections ensure that if there is key information which you might have lost or might lose through this compression are still propagated through the next layers. Yeah, and it, it, it's called unit because, I mean, if you, if you draw the picture in such a way that these layers go down and then go up again, I mean, then it forms like a loop. Yeah? So it's just a matter of how you draw it. Therefore, it's called unit. So you, we can view it as a big autoencoder with skip connections. And um, in imaging sciences, it's actually the most popular unit, uh, the most popular neural network. So for basically all inverse problems, uh, denoising, blurring of images, and so on. This is the architecture you actually always use. Okay, so so that that's what we will what we will use. We will then also do it in a bit more sophisticated way. But let's let's start with this basic picture and uh, our data set. 
um, since we need to certainly train the neural network, I will go in more, more detail on the next slide, um, will be city maps with uh, simulated gradient maps. Yeah, and so, I mean, then the task is to uh, transfer what we learned on the simulations to real life. Okay, so what, what is the data set which we use? Um, so what we took was, was 700 maps from OpenStreetMap. We converted them to morphological images, meaning images where the buildings are just white and everything else is black. Yeah? And so if you're interested, this extensive training data set, you can also download. We have one uh, large data set, uh, which uh, I call course data set. Why I do that uh, will become important in a moment. Um, yeah, so you see, you have these, these city maps. Um, for each map, we had devices um, at eight different locations. And each time we computed by simulations radio map maps using these two different types of approaches. Not dominant path model and intelligent ray trace. But then, I mean, if you think about how, what you would do then um, in real life, I mean, certainly, that's always the first to train the neural network on such large databases. But then, I mean, you might also have access to real data. But if you have access to real data, you don't have it in such a resolution as you have it here when you simulate it. So let's say um, in real life, what you might have is then you might have only, let's say, very few positions of the, of the transmitter per map. And you might also have, since there for real life, you have, let's say, the, the cell phone receptions of some users, you might have not such a, a high resolution, but you might have only 300 receiver samples per map, yeah, 300 points, which you know. But these with very high accuracy, are uh, very high, let's say, I mean, with, I mean, coming from real life. Yeah? So here, I mean, we also, use the simulator for that. But as you see, I mean, it's in some sense very close to what you would actually do if you would have access to such, such real data. OK. Good. So now, I mean, let me show you what, what we did. And uh, so the neural network, which we then trained and designed, we call well radio unit for obvious reasons. It's a unit, and it's um, designed to compute the radio map or radio map estimator. So our input scenarios, um, and I will show you a lot of examples in a moment, are the city maps and uh, transmitter locations. Yeah, so you see the red dot here. And we also, that's a different scenario, have a city map transmitter and some measurements from some users. Huh? So there you have a bit more data. So here you just have a city map and transmitter location. And in fact, you will see our approach can even do without any samples, without any measurements. Then certainly, I mean, you have your input map scenarios. As I said, I mean, we have these morphological images. So the buildings are white, the background is black. That's what we input. And you can, one scenario is that you have an accurate city map. And then we also tested everything on perturbed maps where you might have missing buildings or you might have also unknown cars driving around. And the learning scenario, um, as I said, I mean, we have this first type, this course data set, so this large and dense simulated data set. If I go back, um, yeah, so this is what I said here. And the second scenario is that you have this large and dense data set where you basically um, train your neural network, cause train your neural network, but then you fine train it on this data set where you now have, um, well, like in a real life situation, only sparse uh, locations uh, which you have at hand. Okay, good. So let's, let's look at some, some examples. Um, so what you see here on the left-hand side, you always see the ground truth. And on the right-hand side, you see the, um, the estimation. Now, 
what you have here, yeah, I'm just waiting for this upper bar to leave because otherwise I cannot see the header of it. Um, so let me see, can I get rid of it? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. ah, okay, anyhow. Okay, so, so on the left hand side, you have the ground truth. Here you have the estimation. And um, so the path loss, uh, as you see here, is between minus 127 dB and minus 47 dB. So at some point, we have to cut in a sense. And the error which you make is, as you see, very small, it's 1.6 dB. So here you have an accurate city map. Um, and um, you have, I need to guess since I cannot see the, the top bar right now. I mean, you have, I think, no measurements. Let me see, can I get rid of this? Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. I think it will vanish at the moment. Um, okay, so so what you have here is you have missing buildings. Um, so that's another scenario, which, has, which I already mentioned. You, you have these, these black parts here, these are missing buildings. And now what you see here is the estimation. You see actually that in this case, indeed, this uh, neural network can in paint this building, so it detects that there need to be something. Yeah, so for this, I mean, you have now, you certainly need some measurements. Otherwise, I mean, this, this would not work. I mean, so you need some samples here, um, but using these samples, the neural network can guess that, as you see, I mean, there's a building here and there's a building here. Okay, but then, I mean, you see certainly the error is a little bit higher due to the fact that now I mean, you have a perturbed situation. That's not the surprise. And the, the last one here is concerning with cars. So you see here the ground truth with the cars. And you see again the estimation. And again, the L2 error is very small. Uh, so you have 1.38 dB. So that's again an accurate MET now. I mean, all buildings are their accurate measurements and known cars. Okay, so this what you what I showed you there was just with this course training map. But now, I mean, as I said, we want to also use this sparse real life measurements to fine tune the neural network. So what we then have, we have our first unit. You see here the skip connections, and then we use a second smaller unit afterwards for basically this adapting to this sparse real life measurements. And I will, will show you the difference it makes when you add the second part. Now, and here you see again, I mean, here you see, this is our, always our input and this is then the output, the fine radio map. Now, so here again, you have an accurate map, no measurements, so no samples at all, just the, the location of the transmitter. And, but now you have the second part of the unit, so this adaption to real life. Um, so that's the pass loss, that's the, yeah, so that's first zero shot means not adapting to real life. So it's just the, using these coarse measurements. But now if you adapt to real life, you see, um, you get an, so if you, if you take a look here and compare it with this, you get an improvement. Yeah? And so this will also see in the arrow. Um, if you don't have the second part, you have 4%, but if you adapt to point six. Okay, so I mean, in general, uh, let's look at radio map estimation methods. I mean, certainly, I mean, we are the first to do that. I mean, there are a huge amount of methods available. There are data-driven interpolation methods, model-based prediction and model-based interpolation. Um, so, I mean, these are things we use, then also ray tracing and dominant path model. So that's what we used for comparison. Okay, so let's, Let's take a look at uh, the runtime. So these are the classical methods, dominant path method, ray tracing. And then our method is um, after training, 
by far faster, so it's extremely efficient. And the accurate is also extremely high with 10 to the minus two. Yeah, so, so these are, as I said in the beginning, these are the two tasks you want to achieve. You want to have something really fast and you want to have something really accurate. Oh, and so here um, you see this number of samples versus the normalized mean square. Um, as I said, I mean, our two approaches, one of the approaches doesn't even need any samples. So therefore, I mean, this is basically here, we, we just plotted this line. I mean, it, it's independent on the samples. The accuracy is, accuracy is extremely high. That's the one with samples and these are the other methods. Yeah, so you see, I mean, there's a, actually significant difference in accuracy between the other methods and now the method using deep learning. Okay, so let's let's now also look at uh, real-time localization using radio maps. That's one one application. Of it. Uh, so the scenario is as follows. So this is now what you would do maybe naively. You have a person standing somewhere. You want to estimate her or his location. And what you have at hand are, let's say, you have different transmitter positions. And for each transmitter position, because you have these different cell towers, you have the signal strength. Now, so we have here three different values of signal strengths for this person. And now from this, you want to determine the location. Yeah, so how would you do that? Well, I mean, um, so here you have the signal strengths and then certainly this signal strengths can appear in different locations for this cell tower. Also here, this signal strengths appears in different locations and also here. So you get maps like this. Now, so the same signal strength appears here, 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 and so on. So now, I mean, to locate this person, you would need to overlay all of those and then look where they intersect. Yeah, but then, I mean, here you see it, it might be here. And so this is then the location. I mean, it's certainly extremely nice. Yeah? Um, but so this is something, I mean, let's say the, the philosophy which is behind. Now, what, what we did was we also designed a, a unit for it, which we call lock unit, um, where again, it's, it's a unit. The output is now a localization heat map. We will show that in a moment, which is like a probability density function, how probable it is that a person is in certain locations. Um, you would like to compute the true location and this is uh, the, the loss, which we use, the center of mass. Uh, and so what, what you see here is, um, again, as I said, I mean, you have this, uh, say, real life scenario and uh, the course scenario, the simulated scenarios, you have here five different locations of the transmitter and the green plus is always the location of the person. Uh, and so now, I mean, using this as, let's say, a, a real life scenario and this as a simulation, here you see the different locations. I mean, you can, in this case, since it's always the same method which we use for these simulations, um, you get a very high accurate uh, localization um, estimation of this person. Then, I mean, I can also change it slightly. So this is now my, my, my real life situation. And this is the simulation I assume. Then, you see, if you not take, let's say, this, this fine data, the real life and just the simulation versus both, uh, you see the difference here. Here, I mean, you would now um, assume that it's positioned, the person is positioned here, but here you get a quite accurate uh, approximation of, of the person's location. Yeah, so this, this looks nice, but I mean, certainly uh, you want to see the numbers and how it compares to other types of uh, algorithms. Um, and so here you, you, you see the difference. I mean, what you see is always uh, the, the distance is by far, I mean, the localization is by far more accurate than it was with the other methods. So this is always the, the best, the lock unit. And also the runtime is actually extremely uh, high, uh, extremely low here. I mean, if you write it on GPUs, it's, it's five milliseconds. What you see here is, I mean, if you run it on a CPU, but I mean, a neural network is not designed for running on a CPU. Okay, and this is um, 
comparison to time of arrival method. And again, you see it's, it's much better concerning the accuracy and also the runtime. Okay, um, yeah, so these are future applications which uh, one can anticipate, supervised data, driven link scheduling, base station assignment, and, and so on. I mean, there are a lot of different applications one can use these approach. Let me now spend the last minutes on um, explainability. And then we will also see how you can actually apply it to, to the data at hand. Now, what is explainability? Um, yeah, so the question is, you have a trained neural network, you don't know anything about it, it's just there, you want to open the black box and analyze how it operates. Why is it important? Well, I mean, you might want to have a reason why a decision was taken, in particular, if it affects you. Also, you might get a bit more insight into your data, which is what scientists usually use it for, or maybe you get improvement of trustworthiness. And in the end, you want to have a decision explained as a human explains the decision, but we are far from that at this point. Uh, and so the explanations usually look like this. This is again, a very easy situation where you have a network which classifies digits. Uh, so let's say you have a network which classifies this as a three, and then you might wonder which pixels are important for the decision. And so you get a heat map. That's what the explainability algorithm gives you. And you see, for instance, these openings in the three are important for the decision because they determine that it's a three and not an eight. Yeah, so the color coding indicates how important these pixels are for the decision. Yeah, so how, which features are, are relevant, but I mean, challenges are also what exactly is this relevance? How good is the relevance map? Can we use it also for other modalities? Because here, I mean, basically we don't do imaging with uh, radio units, but I mean, it's, it's a very different modality. So let me, let me explain our approach, which we used, uh, which comes from information theory, from rate distortion theory. Um, you have a classification function and you have an input signal. And now the philosophy is the following. Uh, so information theory, you always have Alice and Bob. Alice has the original image and also a neural network of the classification function. Bob has the same neural network. Now, Alice would like to transmit information, the information to Bob so that he can also classify this correctly. What, can, what Alice can send are just pixels. And so she wants to send the relevant pixels to Bob so that then the decision remains almost the same. Now, Bob has a problem because he gets this partial image, these pixels, but his neural network can only process images. And so you need to obfuscate now to an entire image. And so the least disturbing you can do is to obfuscate by random pixels. Yeah, so that's um, in the comparison here, the rate would be the number of pixels you send and the distortion you see here is the difference in the explanations and um, the expected value of that. Based on that, you can now design an algorithm. You first realize that, I mean, what you truly want, you cannot compute. I mean, the rate distortion function would be minimizing the number of pixels which are transmitted under a constraint that the distortion is bounded. But this, I mean, there's no way you can compute this. You can prove that finding the minimizer is hard, NPPP complete, and also the approximation problem is hard. So you need to relax this, and so this then leads to the algorithm. Um, you see, instead of just saying the pixel is relevant or not, we give it a relevance score between zero and one. I mean, the obfuscation, we also make continuous, the distortion doesn't change, and the rate is now the little r1. So this is the minimization problem we solve. You see, for our explanation, we want to have, it's very concise. We would like to have very few relevant pixels, but we also want to keep the distortion under control. Ah, and so now, let me just show you a couple of examples. I mean, this is, again, very classical in your network. Um, deciding about digits. Uh, so you take this fixed neural network, which has a huge test accuracy. 
And then you can, if network classifies this as a six, you see a different explanations why and where the network looked for that. And you see here, for instance, in our case, the network looked as this opening, which also makes a lot of sense, and at this curve. Sorry. And so here you see various different applications, uh, very different explanations. And then you can also look at how it compares to other approaches. You see here the rate, how many pixels you assign to being relevant as opposed to the error which you make concerning the classification and there ours also outperforms the other. But then, I mean, we, what we did was we also improved this. Let me just briefly walk you through that as well. Um, because in a sense, you, you might wonder why you obfuscate with random pixels. You might drop out of the data manifold that way. So there one can think about something a bit more sophisticated and also pixel-based explanations. I mean, might not be what you would like, but you would like to have explanations which also take into account some structural components. Uh, and so we, we changed the optimization problem slightly um, by now, instead of just taking random pixels, obfuscating with a gun, with a generative adversarial network, which kind of impedes, let's say, in a more natural way. Yeah, and so, I mean, so this extension of the approach makes it then also applicable to images, but also to audio data and a lot of other examples. And also we opened it to not looking at pixel-based explanations, but for instance, doing a wafer transform of the image and then looking at the relevance of the wafer coefficients. Uh, and so this gives a very flexible approach. And so let me show you just some, some examples in the end. Now, so for instance, um, in neural networks, um, one problem is that they sometimes give a wrong decision or reach a wrong decision. Uh, I mean, this are called adversarial examples, and you see this here. Now, so here, accidentally or not accidentally, the neural network classified this as a baby, and we obviously see it's a dog, and this as a screw. We obviously see it's, it's a shirt. This is what pixel-based explanations would say to this image and would say, well, the neural network looked at those pixels. But there, I mean, you cannot see why it reached a wrong decision. But then, I mean, using this more sophisticated approach and also looking at not pixels, but more general structures, you suddenly see what the network actually saw. You see this indeed looks a bit like a baby. And here, I guess you can also see maybe something like a screw. Yeah, so in that sense, with a bit more, let's say, insight and a bit more sophisticated explanation algorithms, you can, get a better idea of what the network saw to get the wrong picture. Of it. And then you can also apply it to all your processing, um, where for instance, questions are whether the magnitude or the phase is more important to decide which instrument it is. Not surprisingly, the phase is the more important one. And so this is now coming back to our application. Um, you see here, this was one example which we computed. Again, you see the city map, you see the transmitter location, you see now the cell phone users, the samples. And the neural network computed this very strange black blob here. And so these, using these explanation methods, we asked the network basically, what did it base its decision in this region on? Why did it put a black area here, because if you stand here, you stand right in front of the cell phone tower. The reception should be extremely good. And so the network, then the explanation was, I mean, the network looked at those people here and they have actually a bad reception. And so then in the end, I mean, this was one of these examples where a building was missing. I mean, there should have been a building in the city. Okay, so I think my time is uh, more than up. So let me conclude. I think deep learning, I mean, shows impressive performance. Theoretical foundations, I mean, is on the go, but I mean, largely missing. What I showed you then as an application was a pass loss function prediction and also localization. Um, and in the end, I alluded a bit to explainability methods. So how you can explain 
decisions of neural networks. And we saw that it also makes sense in this scenario because it can give you additional insights. And with this, I'd like to conclude and thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Kita, for this very uh, inspiring talk. Thank you. So in the meanwhile, there, there were a couple of questions um, in the chat that we would like to address. If there are further questions, please type them there. So Alex Wang is asking, how do we get the ground truth data? Yeah, so, okay, so let, let me go back. I mean, so, so the ground truth data in our case are simulations, yeah? So here we, we have we have only access to simulations. So we use ray tracing, for instance, as, as, an, as a simulation. Um, and so in that case, that's our ground truth. Now, if, you, if, you, if you're a huge telecommunication company, then you might have ground truth data, which is um, real data, but then, I mean, certainly you don't have a sophisticated map like this. You will only have that in specific locations. And still, if you would like to have a resolution of that type, you, you still need to do something like um, from those samples then interpolate. Okay, thank you. So um, there was a question, how do you create multiple radio maps? Uh, how do you fuse these maps for outdoor localization? I think that's, yeah. So, so okay, M multiple, I mean, once you've trained your neural network, I mean, then certainly you can put in your, um, your urban location and the position of the transmitter and maybe something in addition or not, I mean, measurements, and then you compute uh, the radio map in a very fast way. Um, so, I mean, once the network is trained, I mean, it, you, you can generate uh, radio maps and uh, pass loss function prediction on the fly. So that's mm -hmm. then extremely fast. Okay, then there's a question, how does this approach perform when there are multiple transmitters? I'm not sure to which it refers. Ah, okay, so, so what I showed you here was just one transmitter. Um, so this is also, I mean, what we looked at now, but I mean, certainly you, you, can, you can train, I mean, then you would need to train it in a yeah, similar way with, with multiple transmitters. I mean, right now, I mean, these are the scenarios. We, we, but I mean, I, I, I don't see any obstacle of doing multiple transmitters. Thank you. Then there's a question, uh, could you give us more details and interpretations on the radio units structure? Mm, yeah, so, I mean, okay, so, so this part of the radio unit um, we saw here. Yeah. So, as I said, I mean, so the input is this morphological image of the urban environment. So you have uh, basically uh, an image which consists of white areas, which are the, the buildings and black, which is the background. Um, and in addition, you have the position of the transmitter and maybe also samples, but I mean, let, let's forget about the samples. Huh? So these are, these are your inputs, which you input here. I mean, then you walk through this network um, or as I said, I mean, it's first compressed and then expanded again. And what you get here then as an output is again, the same size of your, of your input image um, or now, I mean, the radio map is, is computed. So this part, which you see here is, um, is this part. Now yeah, just, I mean, drawn in a bit different way. So you would, I mean, here you would have, let's say the, these large layers, then you would go down to the small layers and then you would expand again to the large layer. And then what is done here is there's a second unit, smaller, attached to it and computed afterwards, which is responsible for this, this sparse data, for the adaption to the sparse data, for making it a bit more, let's say precise, if you have such data at hand. Now, so, so these are two, two units, um, which are attached to each other. One is a bit smaller. And as I said, I mean, you do it, the characteristic part here, it's like an auto encoder with, with the connection. Yes, thank you. So there's one um, additional question. Um, I'm wondering about the generalization performance of this un radio unit. 
does it influence well in the new environment? I mean, okay, so I mean, in, in general, in, in neural networks, um, as said, you have um, your, your data set, you have your training data, you have your test data. So that's what you test the performance on. Uh, and so the performance of all deep learning based algorithms are always on this, this test data set. Uh, I mean, so that, that's how you measure. So you measure also the performance in some sense uh, in, in um, typically concerning, yeah, concerning real data. I mean, now here we certainly have the simulations. So we compare how it performs on the simulations. And uh, so different scenarios, I'm not really sure what, what, what or different environments, what is meant because I mean, here, this radio unit is certainly not just for one city map. I mean, here you can input any city. Now, so it's, it's trained on all this data, which I had here. So we have 700 maps, it's trained on all those maps. And then you can certainly also input your favorite city map. I don't know, Munich, Berlin, wherever you live. Um, so in that sense, I mean, um, so that's also the performance measures which I showed you are uh, from, yeah, from inputting different uh, city maps as well. Okay, thank you. So uh, from my side, the question, so you, you consider uh, 2D maps or do you also consider 3D maps like? Um, yeah, so that, that's also a very good question. So these are now 2D maps, um, but certainly, I mean, then, that would be a goal to do 3D so that also you, you have, for instance, I mean, the, the height of the, the, the tower, um, the cell tower and so on. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that would be, I mean, that's certainly compu computationally a bit more challenging than to train these, these networks, but um, that, that would be certainly a goal to do it, to bit, get it closer to real life. Thank you. So there's a question uh, from Wolfgang Uczyk. So he, you reported that the proposed method outperforms the ray tracing method, but isn't ray tracing the ground truth in your case? I mean, sometimes. I mean, we use sometimes DPM and sometimes the ray tracing method. So, I mean, but, but, but you see, I mean, okay, so let me go to this. Yeah, I mean, so here, what, what we did, so for instance, the runtime, I mean, there, it, it has nothing to do with, with the ground truth in a sense. And so here the runtime, I mean, you compare to the other methods, it's significantly faster once you train the neural network. So there, I mean, if you have a city map, you compute it with urgent ray tracing, that's what you get. Uh, concerning radio units, you, you get this. Now, I mean, concerning the, the performance, I mean, so we also have this, this uh, two-stage procedure. Uh, so first, of course, course environment and then the precise environment with the different locations. Whereas, I mean, the, the race tracing would compute basically the, the entire entire map. But through this two-stage procedure, I mean, we get much, let's say much, much more detail. Um, and so that leads them to also, in particular, that leads to better accuracy. Thank you. So there's a... Um... Question and comments. Thank you for this very interesting talk. Could you please comment a bit on the expressivity? Are there any best practices for designing uh, DNNs? What means, how and why did you design, for example, the local unit as it is designed? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that's, I mean, I would love to answer this question comprehensively um, concerning expressivity. What, what people do these days is, I mean, Let's say there are some, um, uh, some some common knowledge in some sense. So, for instance, for inverse problems in imaging, you usually take a unit because it performs quite well. And intuitively, you could also think that I mean, first, let's say the key information is extracted through this compression stage and then expanded again. Um, so it's a lot of tr trial and, and error. Um, what what I wish I mean, as a, also as from, a, from a mathematical viewpoint, would be certainly uh, to show that for different problem settings, I mean, certain architectures are optimal to some extent. We are far from that. I mean, some people even say, uh, if you, you ask which network to take, well, I mean, take the largest which fits in your GPU. 
because I mean, some belief and some experiments also show that, I mean, if it's a huge network, um, then, I mean, it, it performs best, I mean, if you have the computational power to train it. So in that sense, I mean, best practices for designing neural networks, yeah, I mean, for certain scenarios, you, you, you know from experiments, uh, from, from experience, uh, which to take. So in that sense, a programmer also needs to have a lot of experience in, in, in doing that. And so here, since it's, um, well, I mean, to some extent an inverse problem, I mean, the unit is, is the most appropriate neural network. And so therefore, I mean, that's also what we took. Okay. There's uh, one further question. Um, could you please go over uh, generalization from a graph theoretic point of view as per one of your recent papers? I'm not sure if this is clear. Um, yeah, but it's, okay. So, so concern. I mean, so the other paper I think which this uh, person refers to is on graph convolutional neural networks. So the question there was um, whether graph convolutional networks generalize, and we solved one part of it, which is transferability. If you have two graphs which mimics the same phenomena, that then the graph convolutional network has the same repercussion. Yeah, and so then, I mean, the similarity between different graphs, you can use this graphone setting for it. But, so this is in the setting of graph convolutional networks, where here, I mean, we, we don't have any, any graph. So in that sense, I mean, um, mm. I, I, I don't see how, how you could link it to that. Okay, thank you very much. So are there further questions? Please write them in the check or chat or raise your voice. I have a question um, regarding the localization. Can you um, comment on, I mean, certainly the localization performance is not the same in, in all maps. So can you comment how a map should look like so that the localization performance is best? For example, if you're in free space, probably this doesn't work yeah, at all. Yeah. And I mean, localization doesn't work, then maybe other methods would outperform this. But if you have uh, yeah, a rich map, it would probably <laughs> be better in performance. Can you comment on this? Okay, so uh, if I understood you correctly, I mean, um, so the more, let's say, obstacles you have, the more complicated it is, um, then you have more information um, at, at hand. Then, I mean, if you're just on the, let's say, standing on a huge flat area, I mean, it's certainly very difficult to locate this, this first. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, in a sense, I mean, I don't have any, let's say, theoretical results, which, which, which says, I mean, you need that many transmitter locations and, and so on. But um, yeah, I mean, I think intuitively, I mean, this is absolutely correct. I mean, if you have more, let's say, obstacles, you have more, more information because, I mean, as we saw in the, uh, in the naive approach, uh, I mean, so there, here, since the, depending on the receipt on the transmitter location, uh, the signal strength is different for for all these um, yeah for, for this person each time. I mean that gives you these let's say different possible locations, and then even with this naive one, you can actually really uh, precisely localize this person. Um, so and then certainly, I mean, if that works to some extent, the naive one, if you have this information, I mean, it works certainly even better if you have a more sophisticated approach. So in that sense, yeah, I mean, the more information you have and these different obstacles give you more information, the better, the better it will be. Yeah, okay. So it's also an interesting question to ask where to put the transmitters, yeah? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, so, so here, I mean, we just took basically some random, random locations in a certain sense, um, but yeah, I mean, that, that, would, that would be an interesting theoretical question, how, how to place them best. Maybe there has already been some, some research in that direction, so that I, I'm not aware of, but I mean, it could be that there are already some results how to best place transmitters if you have a certain model situation of buildings. I, I don't think that should be that difficult. Okay, thank you very much. 
So for the, uh, there's one further question for the local unit, will the number of base station have an impact on the localization accuracy? Probably you partly answered this. Yeah, I mean, so, so the more, let's say, images you, so, so the more different scenarios you have, let's say, so here we have five different positions of this, um, of, of the base station. Um, and so the more you have, I mean, the more information you get about the position and certainly, I mean, with, with the number, it will, will increase. Okay. Um, so the final question, the output of the local unit is a one hot binary image. Will the size of the image uh, Oh no, will the size of the image increases largely to get more accurate localization? I'm not sure if I understand this question. Yeah, me neither. I mean, I also read it. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so it's, it's right. So let me go back what, what, we, what we compute. So we compute a probability density function, um, which then, I mean, shows the probable locations uh, of, of the person. Um, Yeah, I mean, the, the, let's say the larger the scenario, I mean, certainly if you keep the number of base stations the same, the more difficult it will be to locate the person. So if you have a huge scenario and you just have two, two different base station locations, it will be much more difficult than if you, might, if you might have a much smaller scenario. So that's, I mean, I hope that that, that was what this question was about. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Gita, for this nice talk. Yeah, it was very uh, nice to have you today. Um, so let me remind you that next week we have a talk by Angel Lozanos, and he will speak about line of sight MIMO and all theory up to new tricks. So thank you for attending this uh, seminar and hope to see you back next week. <laughs>